Small-Sided Games to Develop Soccer Intelligence, Part 2, Seasoned Program and Complex Games. Read the game situation quickly. Analyze it exactly. Make smart decisions. Act creatively. Play intelligently. An ounce of intelligence is worth more than a pound of muscle. Part one of Small-Sided Games to Develop Soccer Intelligence focuses on preparatory games and variations of mini-soccer. Step by step, the players learn to read game situations quickly and react intelligently. Mini-soccer is an ideal tool for developing and promoting soccer intelligence and coaching soccer techniques in a play context, while not neglecting the conditional aspects of the game. In part two, Horst Wein presents his ability test and the popular mini soccer pentathlon. He shows how to plan and schedule a soccer season with mini soccer competitions and how to offer the players plenty of opportunities to practice the way of playing that they have learned, also in competitive situations. Part two also shows how to make the transition from the simple games of mini soccer to complex games of seven on seven. The number of players and the demands on them are gradually increased, giving them confidence to play in any position on the bigger field. The soccer ability test consists of three different competitions. If the coach carries out this test several times each year, he can document the progress of each individual player and establish a ranking order within the team. In the first competition, the players show how well they have mastered the one-on-one -on -one situation. Number one plays against number two, number three against number four, and number five against number six. The winner is the first player to score three valid goals. He is awarded one point. What are the most common attacking errors? What should the defenders do? During the breaks, the coach uses these questions to stimulate the players to think about what they do and helps them to improve their play. Players 1, 2, and 3 form one team, and players 4, 5, and 6 form another. Two members of one team play against two members of the other team. The third player waits on the touch line. After each goal, the two waiting players replace two field players. The game lasts for three periods of three minutes. Each member of the winning team is awarded two points for the test. What is the best way to play your partner into space? What should the defenders do to win the ball? Which attacking methods are best for creating scoring chances? These are questions that the coach asks in the intervals between the three periods of play. Here we see a successful combination which is started by a dribble. The white team's player draws two yellows toward him and cleverly plays his partner free. The partner overlaps, receives the ball, and scores easily. A skillful 1-2 also has a good chance of success in a two-on-two -two situation, as can be seen here. After each goal, both teams substitute one player. 
The substitution is carried out at the center line. This ensures that there are sufficient rest pauses. The third part of the ability test is a mini soccer game of three on three. Now players one, two, and four play against numbers three, five, and six for three periods of three minutes. The intervals are 90 seconds long as there are no substitutes. At the end of the game, each player of the winning team is awarded three points. The player with the highest number of points from the three competitive games wins the mini soccer ability test. If two players have the same number of points, they play one-on-one -on -one to decide the final winner. If 12 players take part in the test, they are organized into two groups of six. The top three players in each group qualify for the final round. The other players take part in the runners-up round. If there are 18 players, they are organized into three groups. The first two players in each group qualify for the final. The numbers three and four in each group take part in the B round and the numbers five and six take part in the C round. The coaching program is designed to develop players coordination as well as purely soccer specific skills. The players will subsequently be able to master new, complicated, technical and tactical sequences quickly and vary them to good effect. This means that our traditional games of soccer have to be changed. The mini soccer pentathlon is one result of such a change. The first of the five events of the pentathlon is mini soccer with one player remaining inside the shooting zone. In midfield, there is a two-on-two -two situation. One player covers his two teammates, cleverly takes up positions where they can pass to him, and switches the play quickly to the other flank. This game shows which team has mastered the art of playing without the ball. Players who make runs into space create more room for the player who has the ball and pull defenders out of position, making it difficult for them to win possession. The covering player has a good overview and is ideally placed to dictate the play. A sudden switch to the other flank can confuse the opposition and create goal-scoring chances, which clever players can take advantage of. An accurate pass into the channel behind the two defenders immediately signals danger for the defending team. The coach repeatedly encourages the players to communicate and discusses their errors in the intervals. The second game in the mini soccer pentathlon is a coordination relay. The teams stand in a line near their goal. On a signal from the coach, the first player of each team sprints to the six meter line and touches it with his foot, then runs to his goal and touches it with his hand. Finally, he sprints to the cone in the center of the field. Jostling is an accepted part of the game. On the way back, the player leaps over a two meter wide ditch marked by two balls or cones. Finally, he runs back to the goal and taps the next player, who then takes his turn. Each player runs twice. The content of the relay can be varied at will.
The third game focuses on through passing to a front runner. Each team has one attacker in the shooting zone where he runs into positions to receive passes from his teammates in midfield. This front runner and the midfielders are not allowed to leave their assigned zones. After each second goal, the front runner swaps places with one of the midfielders. In the second half of the game, the attackers are not allowed to score. The midfielders must therefore push forward quickly to score a goal. The opposition players are also allowed to leave the midfield so that they can challenge the attackers and prevent them from scoring. A good understanding between passer and front runner is very important. A game of tag two robbers now follows. The cops team stands near its goal, while the robbers take up positions in the shooting zone. On a signal from the coach, the first cop tries to tag two robbers as quickly as possible. Leaving the shooting zone is equivalent to being tagged. The cop runs back and tags the second robber. When each cop has had a turn, the two teams swap places and tasks. There is a home and an away game. The team with the lowest time is the winner. The content of this game can be varied at will. All types of tag games are important for soccer players. They improve their decision-making skills and, not least, their coordination. Rapid changes of pace and direction improve the reflexes of all the players. One thing should not be forgotten. The players love playing all types of tag games and are always totally motivated when they can measure themselves against other players. The last game of the soccer pentathlon is a mini soccer game of three on three. The official rules of mini soccer without a goalkeeper apply. Playing time, three periods of three minutes separated by a one minute pause. If each team has a substitute, the playing time is three periods of five minutes. The mini soccer pentathlon promotes coordination skills in a play context. The players enjoy a varied and competitive coaching program. In just one hour, two teams of three or four players compete against each other in three simplified soccer games and in two small competitive games. The team that wins three or more of the games is the winner of the pentathlon. Keeping score is relatively easy and requires no great effort. It is immediately clear who has won. The Soccer Pentathlon is a competitive system for club coaching sessions for players of all ages. It can also be carried out easily as part of a soccer school. As in the case of the ability test, the Mini Soccer Pentathlon can also be held in the form of a tournament. If more than 12 players are present, four teams play each other on two fields. The rankings of the teams are determined in two finals or in a competition in which all of the teams play against each other. Coaches and teachers can change the games as they wish and adapt them to suit their coaching objectives. They have a variable game system which is easy to organize and put into practice.
The following scrolled text shows a possible competition structure for a season. You can adapt it to suit the length and time of your season. Besides the official games, clubs should organize a club internal mini soccer league. Fantastic learning results can be achieved and are an argument in favor of this project. Each week there is a different mini soccer variation. The coaches prepare the players for the new games in the coaching sessions. The players develop their playing ability step by step. They also improve their basic skills and become more familiar with using them. Thanks to this game structure, the players learn intensively not only during coaching sessions, but also in competitive games. Week 1. Mini soccer with one defender behind the 6 meter line is on the schedule. We have already described this game in detail in connection with the mini soccer pentathlon. Week 2. The restriction placed on the week 1 game no longer applies because the players have learned how to pull defenders out of positions. Now, the official rules of mini soccer without a goalkeeper apply. This game can be played in three variations with different learning aims. First, a goal only counts if each attacker has already had at least one ball contact. Second, the ball must not be played above head or waist height. Third, when a goal is scored, all of the members of the scoring team must be in their opponent's half. Week 3, we play mini soccer with dribbling the ball over a goal line. More advanced players can be asked to carry out additional tasks. The players have to demonstrate a trick on the goal line, such as Zidane's spin. You can find a detailed description of this game in Part 1 and in the supplement on this DVD. Week 4, the teams play mini soccer with diagonally opposite goals. This game improves the awareness of the players and increases their field of perception to 360 degrees. The players have to create and exploit two-on-one situations before their opponents strengthen their defense, win possession, and score themselves. Week 5. The team can only attack after it has strung together at least three passes after winning possession. Alternatively, it can be required to make four passes or retain possession for a given time. In this way, the players learn to retain possession by passing to each other and selecting safe passing paths. Mini soccer choosing any goal is the variation for week six. There are four goals, but only three defenders. One goal is therefore always undefended. Only a player with good awareness realizes quickly enough which goal he can attack without meeting any resistance. Mini soccer with through passing is scheduled for week seven. One striker is in the shooting zone. Only when the ball is passed to him can the defenders chase back and challenge for the ball. Alternatively, the midfielders are only allowed to pass the ball in the air to the striker. 
The focus of the coaching is on the first and second touch, trying to control the ball quickly while under pressure from the opposing players. In another variation, the striker is not allowed to score. The midfielders push forward and score when the striker lays the ball off to them. The aim is to improve the interpassing between the midfielders and the striker. Week 8, the Make It, Take It game helps the players to learn how to switch rapidly. After a goal is scored, the scorer immediately passes the ball to a player who is running into space in midfield. The defending team can only challenge for the ball outside the shooting zone. The attackers should exploit this small advantage to close down space in midfield. The winner is the team that scores the most goals. Week 9, we finish the season with mini soccer giving width when attacking. Two six-yard wide goals are formed by placing cones near the touch lines about halfway down the field. Before the attackers can penetrate into the opposing half, they have to pass or dribble the ball through one of these two goals. The players learn to build up attacks down the flanks and to switch the play to the other flank if it is easier to advance there. Coaching is a development process with tasks which become steadily more difficult from week to week, month to month, and year to year, but which never make demands that exceed the physical and mental capabilities of the players. This is the official playing field for 7-on-7. Seven seven. The exact dimensions are given in the supplement on this DVD. To help the players develop a feel for the larger field, the coach sets up a mini soccer pitch in the 7-on-7 seven seven field. The players carry out more complex tasks from game to game, and the number of players gradually increases. Each player should learn to play in every position. This is the basic setup for three on three without a goalkeeper. The mini soccer field with four small goals is used, but the players gain an impression of the seven on seven field with the two large goals. The players repeat all the ways of playing that they have learned in the mini soccer variations. They retain possession of the ball when necessary. They create two on one situations and quickly exploit them to score. Their positional play is good and they are able to spot free space, enabling them to mount fast counterattacks. Here we see a variation with one defender who stays behind the six meter line to cover his teammates and bring his midfielders into the play. Alternatively, the players can move at will within the limits of the mini soccer field. The action radius of the third player of each team is therefore no longer restricted. In another variation, the small goals are replaced by cone goals. A goal is scored when a player dribbles the ball over one of the two goal lines. The next variation focuses on through passing. Each team has one attacker in the shooting zone who takes up positions where he can receive a through pass from midfield. An interesting variation is when a goal can only be scored from outside the shooting zone. The emphasis is on accurate shooting. This is the basic setup for three on three with a goalkeeper. Each goalkeeper guards two goals, which are eight meters apart.
the goalkeepers observe the play and adjust their position to the game situation. They concentrate on the actions of the field players so that they can recognize early which goal will be attacked. They must always be prepared to switch to the other goal if the opposing team suddenly switches its point of attack. The attackers adjust their passing to the way the defenders play, and in particular to the positioning of the opposing team's goalkeeper. Passers try to disguise where and when they will pass the ball. This is the last game that takes place within the limits of the mini field. All of the other games are carried out using the 7-on-7 seven -seven field with a goal measuring 6 by 2 meters. Mini soccer with a shot at the goal. You have to dribble through one of the opposing team's cone goals and then shoot at the large goal within three seconds. Okay? The game played on the mini soccer field is now scaled up for the first time to the seven on seven field. The players leave the mini field by dribbling over one of the two end lines and must then score a goal within three seconds. A goal has to be scored quickly, otherwise it does not count. Once the attacker has crossed the mini field end line, the defenders are no longer allowed to challenge him. Each team has one striker in the zone behind the two cone goals. In midfield, there is a three-on-three -three situation. By clever passing or sudden dribbles, the midfielders try to create an opening to pass the ball through a cone goal to the striker. The size of the cone goals depends on the level of skill of the players. The strikers watch how the play develops and take up positions to receive a through pass. After controlling the ball in the zone, the striker must shoot at the large goal within three seconds to score a valid goal. In this game, each team has another two players, one striker behind the cone goals and one defender in front of the cone goal. Each team therefore consists of six field players and one goalkeeper. The additional defender tries to intercept the through passes of the midfielders in front of the cone goals. If he succeeds, he passes the ball to his teammates in midfield. If a striker gains possession in the zone behind the cone goals, the defender helps his goalkeeper to defend his goal. In one variation of the game, the defender is positioned behind the cone goals. This means that there is a two-on-one situation in the zone behind the mini-field goals. After an initial offside free period, the offside rule is then applied. Every five minutes, the players swap their roles and positions until everyone has played in every position.
One of the whites will now play a through pass. A white can then push forward to support the attack, and one of the blues can fall back to help the defense. This means that instead of two on one, we have three on two. Here is the second defender who hurries back to help his teammate in the defense. This is the third attacker, who pushes forward from the midfield and tries to score a goal. The tasks gradually become more complex and the players have to control a steadily growing area. The players slowly familiarize themselves with the large seven-on-seven -seven field. Now the four cone goals are removed. The attackers can now move freely outside the mini field. The official rules of seven on seven apply, initially without, then with the offside rule. The players' roles are as follows. One goalkeeper, one defender, three midfielders, and two strikers. Every five minutes, the players swap roles and places until each player has played in every position. Before the game starts, the players must know their concrete offensive and defensive roles. Now pay attention. First of all, we will play with offside behind the cone. Our players are now fully aware of the official rules for the game of 7-on-7. Seven seven. Everything else is up to them. We wish you lots of success when you try out the many attractive games which are ideal for developing and promoting the soccer intelligence of your players. A fast soccer player is recognizable not only by his physical speed, but also by his speed of thought. His sprinting ability and his explosive start are backed up by his ability to read game situations and make rapid decisions. An intelligent soccer player understands how to perceive game situations rapidly, analyze them accurately, and solve them correctly without losing any time. There are several other excellent DVDs, books, and videos available on our website, www.reedswain.com, from Peter Schreiner. On DVD and video, coordination, agility, and speed training for soccer provide step-by-step -step progressions of over 200 exercises to increase player speed, balance, agility, footwork, and turning ability. Also on DVD and video, 
Coordination and agility training with a soccer ball combines technical training with coordination. The exercises allow the players to practice technique at game-like intensity levels while improving their overall fitness, coordination, explosiveness, quickness, and agility. The Companion Book, Coordination, Agility, and Speed Training for Soccer. Get the most out of your agility ladder with Peter Schreiner's book, Effective Use of the Agility Ladder for Soccer. Full of fun and effective games and drills, coaching youth soccer covers every aspect of youth coaching with clear and easy to follow diagrams and instructions. The soccer aerobics video includes hundreds of exercises to develop rhythm and coordination. Players of all levels enjoy this excellent workout. The three-part DVD and video series, The German Touch, covers every aspect of control, dribbling, developing the first touch, and beating an opponent. Part one covers dribbling and fainting. Part two, playing with an opponent at your back. And part three, individual skills and ball control. In the best-selling book, The Creative Dribbler, coaches will find many excellent ideas to make their coaching sessions varied and motivating while concentrating on developing technique and the first touch. The video Pendulum Training offers hundreds of excellent fun and challenging exercises to develop your player's skills, heading, and touch with the use of a suspended ball.